Hi all, thanks for watching. I'm gonna be talking today about the importance of doing research inside and outside museums. I recently started at the University of Washington as a professor and investigator at the biology department and as a curator of birds here at the Park Museum. I'm working at the Behavioral Ecophysics Lab, which is aimed at understanding the links between the ecology of animals in nature and the rules of physics that everything has to obey. I do that by obtaining 3D reconstructions of structures such as bill, tongues, and wings here at the Park Museum. And I also perform experiments with captive birds, creating electronic devices that are helpful for the study. I do that at the Department of Biology. And I translate all of these experiments and this knowledge into the field by working at this research center in Colombia. Why hummingbirds? Because they are a great system to study these links, and here is why. They really push the limits of vertebrate design by having really tiny sizes and amazing metabolic rates that allow them to have this incredible endurance on this unique hovering style across birds and they can perform up to thousands of visits to flowers every day. Now we are able to understand how they perform this process, how they can extract the nectar, and this is actually the link between biomechanics and coevolution. How much energy they can gain from evolutionarily coupling the bill shape to the flower shape. So here are some examples, the sword bill in this passiflora, sickle bill in this heliconia. Even in your backyards, you can see how well the flowers are matching the bird shape to deposit the pollen and use them as pollinators. Some plants like this heliconia tortuosa actually seem to be torturing these poor birds, making them fly upside down to drink uh, up to the last bit of nectar from it. In this video, I'm going to show how they do it. In just a second or so, a hummer has lapped up all the liquid the little chamber offers and moves on in a constant dance among the flowers. But how is it possible for a tongue thinner than a fishing line to perform such a feat so fast? Inside his workshop, Alejandro is creating something special. He's mounting a real flower onto one of his clear feeding tubes with a cutout on the side, a window to the inside of the flower. Now, with high-speed macro photography, we see something truly new. Hummingbirds' long tongues have four tips that open as the tongue dips into the nectar fringe of tiny filaments uncurls along the edges of the open tips, creating grooves that spring open, filling the tongue with nectar. The structure science has never seen before, and it's an incredibly efficient technology for picking up a liquid. And this is actually a window to that, those factors that we can take into consideration to understand the hummingbird economics, is, if you wish. In nature, the currency is energy. So we can calculate how many calories they get per second, how much time it takes for each bill to feed the flower and get the nectar out, and to understand how they are able to survive on these. We take three-dimensional scannings of their bill and tongue structures and go deeper into the composition of those structures to try to match how the morphology links with the mechanics. Here you're seeing a hummingbird bill tip extending the tongue out to reach the nectar. And the structure at first is flat. But then, when you keep playing the video, you see that this structure has sprung open allowing the nectar to fill it completely. And this is so efficient because it happens 
in about a hundred of a second. This is what makes the tongues so amazing. Now, with the information that we gather from museum specimens, we can reconstruct how this process works in different species and how we connect that to this, what they do in nature, which is so quick that we need high-speed cameras to be triggered automatically. And this is a design that we had to do because there weren't commercial high-speed cameras available to trap the action when the hummingbird goes to the theater. We developed these by training hummingbirds to come to artificial feeders that we modified to see how they treat, such as this one. And finally, you can obtain videos such as this one, which is already slowed down, but you can see how the nectar is being collected. And when you do the analysis frame by frame, you can actually understand how they are able to deplete the pool of nectar in less than a second. Coupling that with the morphology and how the tongue works and the bones associated with it, we can then develop models that allow us to understand not only how the tongue works, but how that fluid is transported inside and then finally swallowed. All of this information is relevant when we're trying to understand how much energy they get from the nectar, but this is only half of the equation in hummingbird economics. The other half is how much they have to pay to access to that energy in those flowers. To understand that, we need to understand how they fly and how their wings work. We're lucky that here at the Bird Museum, we have the largest spread wing collection of birds in the world. And this allows us to perform measurements such as the length and the area and other measurements that are related to aerodynamics and how they use their wings to actually provide that lift that they need to sustain themselves. To study those kinematics, we then perform these experiments with captive birds in which we have them fly in different positions from different angles. We slow them down so we can understand how they are accomplishing these feats and with wild birds, now that we understand how they're flying, we can then train them to these respirometry devices, which are actually pulling air from this little chamber to understand how much oxygen they're using in the process. So how are they fueling that extreme flight? All of these allows to understand better how much energy they need, which flowers they should visit, how many flowers they should visit, and when to fight for that. So here, I'm gonna show now a video that goes into the fighting strategies of hummingbirds, which is the last bit of research that I wanna share with you today. The hummingbird and the flower, it's a perfect pair. Just look how the long slender bill matches the shape of the flower. But as anyone with a popular hummingbird feeder knows, these birds are also furious fighters. The Aztecs knew it. Their god of war was a hummingbird. The warriors were known to wear their feathers into battle. They were so on target. Scientists working in Colombia have found that for some of these birds, evolution has actually turned their beaks into swords. To study these birds, researchers set up high-speed cameras in the rainforest. They recorded interactions that looked like dueling fences. The hummingbirds had some pretty good moves. There's the stab, where the bird charges its rival like a jousting knight, or the feint and parry, where the birds fight it out beak to beak until one tosses the other aside. And of course, the pinch and pluck, where the birds use their strong bills to bite and rip out feathers. All hummingbirds fight, but in these birds, the males had beaks that had been radically reshaped. These were thicker, more rigid, often hooked at the end, and in some cases, they had jagged points like rows of teeth. These weaponized bills were much less efficient at feeding. The hooked bill and the serrations both interfered with the tongue. But then again, 
A weaponized bill allowed the males to control access to the flowers. It doesn't matter how well you drink, you don't let anyone else near the nectar. At one time, it seemed like bill shape was all about matching the flower. Now, it's pretty clear, the bird does not live by nectar alone. So with these wonderful discoveries, we are able to engage many different audiences. For instance, this is a kids magazine in which they are using these stories to teach math, talking about hummingbird flight. Finally, I wanna end by pointing out that all this field work is inextricably linked to museum work and I wouldn't have been able to discover any of these without museums. So what we have here are real jewels of information and I would encourage you to support these priceless treasures. Uh, thank you for your attention.